<laughs> okay, hello everybody. So it's my pleasure to welcome Josef Sommer to the channel. And uh, Josef and I have a really interesting project together where he provided some excellent, uh, I guess, modern classical music. Is this uh, how you could call it? And then, I would describe it as such, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, I added a video which is uh, marine life and all kinds of macro footage, schools, and then so there is a fusion between uh, music and visual art. Now, uh, thank you again for your time. So, you know, I, I have to confess, even though I love listening to classical music, I uh, my talent in actually performing and making music is, is very low. So, you know, my parents realized this early on, so that they, they never, uh, you know, encouraged me much in this direction, uh, rightfully so. But it's um, the, um can you can you just uh, say a few words about the uh, the music which you contributed? And uh, I should also say you are the director of uh, Shakespeare Conference, right? And you are based in Boston and Massachusetts in the U.S. Yes. So the Shakespeare Concerts is an organization I run, uh, but that is basically uh, a small portion of my music, which is based on Shakespeare, but is also the portion that is most intriguing to the general uh, classical music public. So uh, I write, a, I've written a couple Shakespearean operas, Hamlet and the Tempest, and I've written, I don't know, tons of uh, maybe 40 settings of 40 sonnets and, and another 50 or 60 scenes and such from Shakespeare. And those are the most popular pieces in my musical output, popular in the classical music world, which is not really popular. So when you know, say popular, I mean within a that niche of classical music and even more uh, diminutive because uh, it's uh, it's not the classical music that most people know. I'm writing new music, uh, though it's tonal and accessible. It has a very small group of people who are interested, though some of them are fanatical, so it's great. Um, so yes, uh, the string quartets that I wrote were based upon my... Uh, not based, they were inspired. I hate to use the word inspired because it gives the aroma of the popular vision of the composer so struggling in, in a, a dark basement, though I do live in a dark basement and compose, but I'm not struggling, but waiting for a flatus, waiting for the muses to inspire the angels, him or her, but, angels to kiss, yes. right, and to bring. Yes, uh, exactly. The the angels bringing the music to Palestrina. And, well, well, it's really intellectual yeah. work, right? It's you, you yeah, know, you're, well, you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. I always love the fact that Palestrina believed that angels had brought him his music for his his famous mass, and then the uh, composer uh, Fitzner wrote an opera about Palestrina. And the angels bring him this music, and I and the it's a nice opera, but the the conceit of it is that angels are going to dictate music to composers. But it seems like mm -hmm. angels only dictate music to composers who have studied music theory assiduously for years and years. Uh, Why uh, don't uh, the angels just pick anyone? Exactly. Right? So the, the, the angels don't don't bring anybody equations, or they don't bring anybody uh, right. You know, theories in geology. Why should it be different? You know, it's, it's the same in exactly. music, right? You, you need to do some exactly. intellectual work. Yeah. Exactly, but wait, I, I lost, I lost my train of thought, which was what, what is the? Oh, so I wrote exactly. So, so what, what are the pieces we we added the marine life footage with? So there's string, right. qu string quartets, two string quartets called Sea Change One and Sea Change Two. Not my most uh, brilliant titles, but it, what they are are uh, string quartets in which I'm creating a metaphor for my experience underwater because I'm an avid 
scuba diver and snorkeler, and I've spent untold hours full fathom five beneath the surface. So the idea was not to create something that sounded like scuba diving, which would just be better to just have a uh, just a, a, a tube going underwater and blowing bubbles because that's all that you really hear, but rather to create an aesthetic uh, metaphor for the experience of, of, uh, of different underwater explorations that I've, I've uh, participated in. So each movement described a, a particular experience, but also I don't want to handcuff people upon hearing it. This was, it's a, it's all just metaphorical. It's that these pieces ref, are my reflecting on, uh, on various dives. And I constructed the structures to reflect that particular dive. But I have to be clear when I, when I write something that's that's inspired by and that's reflective of a specific thing, I don't expect the percipient, the audience, to see that thing. So, for instance, if I'm describing the color red, and I do that through music, and a listener experiences the smell of coffee, I feel I've succeeded in creating some connection to them that was very similitudinous. It created a truthful sort of feeling, but that they didn't hear red, but, but smelled coffee. That's acceptable. And the same with the sea change quartets. Interesting, interesting. So, so essentially you're, uh, you're aiming for a rich experience without uh, being you know, very clear what the rich experience will have to be, because there will always be your art plus uh, you know, what the experience, you know, what the previous life experiences of the listener. Yeah. Yes. So now, there are differences because uh, in, in regard, completely abstract music, in that I write a lot of music with text, mm -hmm. and then I am illustrating something that's not abstract. And I do that a lot. Most of my work is to text, and that's actually a lot easier than abstract music for me because there's this uh, a, a literary structure underneath it but with yeah. the sea change quartets they were written to reflect again an actual actual experiences but only in my head now when i uh went to you with these pieces i as as in our correspondence i didn't expect you have the same response nor was that important to me what what i was hoping and what i think you did well was to was to match your experiences underwater with vi visually with what you were hearing so that where i might have been hearing a, uh, a vortex of barracudas you experienced it as uh uh, a uh, a, a nudibranch slowly moving across uh, uh, the literal plane. So, so and so, that so is, is go ahead. Yeah. No, this I'm just saying a, that exactly what interests me. So, how do you find this match between you know uh, images, moving images, and music? And I think that uh, when I thought about this, there's this, you know, this simple match, right? That the, the music might have a certain uh, rhythm and then the um, melody, and then there's a shrimp moving in a certain uh, way. And, the, you know, uh, yeah. probably the, but I, th I think uh, it's more than that, right? There's a certain vibe, there's a certain mood the music uh, will put you in, and you want to have uh, visual images which transfer the similar mood. So, you know, like a, going with underwater images, you could have like a, aggressive music, you know, which your pieces are not, and there would be a shark coming at you. And both of these would give you a mood as in, I'm being attacked, right? Whereas your music, I thought it, it was it was peaceful, but it was also, you know, very complex, and you, you really had to pay attention. So, 
uh, you know, I, I tried to add this uh, this shrimp, which you know, this tiny, fragile creature. Something would move around. So if you look at this shrimp, you would probably get into a similar vibe as with your music. Would, would you agree that this was this is often the best way of um, uh, matching music to uh, visuals? Yes, in this way, mm -hmm. your your interpretation of my music mm -hmm. is your interpretation. It is a personal response, mm -hmm. and that is exactly how I expect people to hear my music anyway, especially my mm -hmm. abstract music, is that they'll have their own personal responses. And so what your um, cinematic treatment of the music is, is your, is your aesthetic reaction to my music how you felt during that piece it's not mine but mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. not important to me i'm not i'm not trying to um put everyone in a in, in a joe summer straight jacket i have no interest in that uh, I, uh, when i have my operas performed and my scenes performed there will be a stage director and then there are singers and they'll do what they want Mm -hmm. And that's once I'm done with the composition, if my music is any good, it should communicate to people in their own headspace, if you will. They need to have their own vision of what it is so that it's no longer just a, a reflection of my own construction. Which is very interesting, and I think it's in contrast to a lot of the, you know, popular music we're getting fed with these days. Like, particularly, like if you think about an advertisement, right? right. The people making this advertisement, you know, who are often, you know, who are talented videographers and, and musicians, but they want the audience to think exactly what they want them to think, yes. which is, you know, buy this, right? You know, this right. soft, this soft drink will make you happy. Whereas, whereas yes. you're essentially telling people, well, you know, you need to do your own uh, aesthetic thinking. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was younger, a, uh, a Madison Avenue, literally a Madison Avenue mm -hmm. um, a commercial firm wanted mm -hmm. to hire me to, uh, to write music and uh, offered me a stunning amount of money to do so. And they had an audition for me in which they uh, showed me uh, well, they had me look at this Alka-Seltzer uh, cartoon. It was a cartoon about uh, uh, like a hand-drawn uh, uh, cartoon of, about someone taking Alka-Seltzer. And they so, said, so, can so, you... So that's, that, that's something you, you drink when you have an upset stomach, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said, can you, can you illustrate this musically? And I did. I just said, all right, well, that you just need a little cello here and a little flute here. And they loved it because, yes, they said that we you're perfect. You weren't trying to write a melody. You were you're you're selling the Alka-Seltzer through your musical interpretation of the images and the Alka-Seltzer. And they offered me a ridiculous amount of money. And I said, no, that's not for me. But. That's not to say these the people who do this are not skilled. They oh, are very much remarkably yeah. skilled. Yeah, uh, but, but it's, it's just it's not the intention is different. The intention. Yeah, they, they, they don't yeah. want they want their their audience to not think. Or yes, and think a specific yes. They specific. want uh, the audience to be in lockstep with whatever their message is. And I think a lot of that is true about a lot of composers and musicians in general. They want to create a specific um, mind frame of a uh, frame of mind mindset. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not interested in that, which is always, by the way, surprising to my stage directors and my musicians when they mm. say, um, "Is this is this what you were thinking?" And I go, "No, but I like what you did." So yeah, exactly. To, to me, the the the. Uh, my end, my I'm finished when I've finished the mm -hmm, page. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. page. Nice, so nice. This is, this is just sitting. This is what I'm working on right now. So I finished this. It's in my that page is one of hundreds of pages in a piece I'm working on right now, and and I'm satisfied that I've made a, a piece of um, 
music that's going to communicate something to people, but now, not now, specific parameters in their head. I'm sure, or I would assume you probably read uh, The Doors of Perception by Huxley. Yes. So I, th I think he, what he argues that if you have a close-up of even like, I'm coming to that close -up purpose, of a human face, that alone is a psychedelic experience because you, you normally don't see that. Yeah. And, and I, I uh, worked a lot with real extreme close-ups and making these videos and uh, not just close-up, but close-ups of uh, animals, organisms with which most people are not familiar. So these shrimps, which I'm filming, or anemones, they could be there in reality, that, you know, the size of my pink nail, but people yes. don't know that, right? They could be the size of a volleyball. So I think this almost, so, so you were, I found it interesting that you were um, asking me to not include scuba divers. Right. Why? Why? Because a scuba diver obviously is a person who is, you know, between 150 and 200 centimeters long. <laughs> and uh, and so, so such a person is a frame of reference. Right. And I think, I think not giving a frame of reference is not telling people what to think about these images. And yes. I, I, think, I think this goes very well with what you were saying, that um, we, you, know, you, you want people to essentially come up with their own thoughts and you know, uh, mental trajectories about your music. I think of my music as a method to alter uh, consciousness. Nice. So the idea is to create an altered state of consciousness in the listener and allow them to experience something within them in a time frame that is outside of normalcy so that they don't experience time anymore in the way that we do se sequentially. They, they are now in a, uh, a different a transcendent state if I'm successful. And uh, I mean, speaking of the Huxley and speaking of uh, just the concept of, of uh, the altered state of consciousness, mm -hmm. I find myself, um, my wife, who's a, a therapist and is a, uh, and works with uh, altered states of consciousness, including working with people with um, psilocybin and, and uh, nice, uh, nice. various chemicals. The, uh, the altered state of consciousness is uh, what I want my listener to be in. So uh, you might, the listener to my string quartets might find, I hope that they find that what I do is I bring them in through the opening measures of the music. I try to catch them and catch their consciousness in a way that obliterates the quotidian reality of uh of chronological time and they're now in a world in which time is suspended and that's what music does in any case is that you don't listen to a particular note in music you're listening to everything in the context of what you've heard five minutes ago and what you will hear in five minutes so the the great way the great music is not an experience that you have in the moment it's an experience you must develop over hearing it over and over again so that you are not only at the opening measures of a beethoven string quartet but you're also 25 minutes away so that you know why you you are on a, on a journey in, in this in this time free zone when you talk about the altered states the the ways that we uh, experience our reality and you say you could do close-ups most of my diving is i'm in an altered state uh and law and the majority of time i'm actually doing exactly what you're talking about which is looking at the life with uh in a way that's not normal i just brought this which is i have several magnifying lenses that i've used ever since i started diving so that when i'm diving I will just find a shrimp. I'll, I will find one tiny invertebrate of, or a, uh, uh, some pelagic larval creature that's just settling onto the reef and just stare at that. I've had dive guides who just dragged me away from things because, uh, and same with my wife, we'll just be staring at one thing 
and experiencing that. And it is an altered state of consciousness. The only one is just enveloped within the that that creature and its environment and it's an and it's in a completely alien environment i mean exactly, diving exactly. you have gravity starting, is going exactly starting with your own bodily perception right you are yeah. uh, all of a sudden you are neutral you're floating yeah yeah exactly and not even of, i wouldn't call it floating because you yeah. you're, you're you're in stasis if your buoyancy exactly. is correct exactly. you're just you are you are no longer Hovering. you're no longer yeah. part of 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 uh of gravity and anything normal you are you are no longer connected to the earth in a in a way that we are uh, the rest of the time which is there's an up and a down and there's a there's a tendency to go down once you have a control of your buoyancy and you're just there with the sea like a fish you are in a in, a, in an other universe uh by the way my wife and i have extremely great buoyancy not because of our thousands of dives but because we both were horn players so as professional horn players very interesting you, you know, I've seen so so I, I still yeah. teach scuba, right? And uh, that's typically what mm -hmm. I ask people: Are you are you uh, some kind of endurance athlete, or are you a, a brass player? And, exactly. Uh, oh, so you know, so you know yeah, exactly. Very, very interesting that you're saying this. And you know, so people who are uh, you know cycling six hours a piece, obviously they have to have very good control of their breathing. But uh, also uh, people who are, are playing music with their lungs and. Uh, you know, there's a, the mass clearing skill, which a lot of people don't manage, but anybody right. who has that experience is, you know, it's easy for them and the buoyancy so that, you know, your lung is an organ to uh, manipulate airflow in and out of your body. And that exactly. is, yeah, very interesting. Practice, Practice from our youth, where as a horn player, yeah, we exactly. had to be able to breathe yeah. in such a way as to create long tones. Exactly. And the long tones require a consistent exhalation that lasts for 20 to 30 seconds when you're playing a, a long tone in a Wagner piece. So like when I'm playing, uh, when I played fourth horn in, in Parsifal, Good Friday music, and I knew here comes this low E flat that I've got to hold for 20 seconds, then I'm just able to breathe in and then out with completely Very interesting control. that you came to this conclusion. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, it, this is really something that, you know, like I've, I've started asking my scuba students this often, you know, like, are you uh, a brass uh, playing musician? Uh, then it, it makes a big difference. Really yes. Cool. So yeah, when, um, when, yeah, dive guides, <laughs> when dive guides first meet me and they're, they're confused by my, my my buoyancy and I and they say oh you must practice that. I say no 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 I'm a horn player it's just it's just the way that my wife and I breathe is this is this is just how we naturally breathe and we just have adapted it underwater so that you know, but yes we're getting back and now we're talking yeah. dive so, so, so uh, you know very good uh, conversation I think we have already given our audience a lot of good material for thought and you know for altered uh, state of consciousness thought. Uh, you know, this this almost calls for a sequel. This almost calls for a sequel. But uh, I think we should for today we should uh, close it now. And uh, what we what I want to uh, stress out so the uh, sea change um, uh, music plus uh, underwater visuals is available in a couple of ways. So if you're in the uh, Boston area on the U.S. East Coast, you will be able to see this live, and uh, there, uh, this will be available online, and you probably can uh, order it on uh, DVD. So you know all the links are in the trans in the description. <laughs> You yes. got to say this when you're on YouTube. No, um, I understand. Yeah, uh, this was awesome. So, uh, yeah, everybody, you know, any comments uh, or any questions anybody uh, has, please, we will uh, make, give a very best to answer this. And um, thank you again for your insights, for your time, and uh, see you very soon. Thank you. <laughs>